Welcome to Widener University Commonwealth Law School. My name is Christian Johnson. I'm the dean of the school. And we are thrilled to see all of you here for this important topic, bail, risk release, and reform. Uh, our program for our jurists and residents is a really important uh, event for us. We have Judge Susan Schwab here tonight who will be uh, speaking and, and leading our panel. And I'm now going to turn the time over to Jill Family, who's the director of our Law and Government Institute here at the law school. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Widener Law Commonwealth and our annual Jurist in Residence program. The program will take place for about an hour, and we invite you all to join us for a reception following the program in the gallery. Thank you to Dean Johnson and all of my faculty colleagues and our wonderful alumni for all of their support for the Long Government Institute. Thank you also to Sandy Grafe and Brian Fernbaugh for helping to make this event possible. And also to our Law and Government Patrick Murphy Fellows, Lindsay Eisinger, and Kim Creech. And finally, one last big thank you to PCN for um, recording and broadcasting this particular program. So the Law and Government Institute here at Widener Law Commonwealth is dedicated to the study of government law including the role of lawyers in setting and implementing policy. At Widener Law Commonwealth, students may earn a certificate in law and government that provides them with hands-on experience in government law. The Law and Government Institute is proud to sponsor the Jurist in Residence program and is thrilled to welcome our new Jurist in Residence Chief Magistrate Judge Susan Schwab. Judge Schwab is not only an alumna of our law school, but she was the law school's first valedictorian. We are so proud to have her back as our jurist in residence. We appreciate her tremendous support for the law school and our students. Judge Schwab's appointment to the Middle District of Pennsylvania in 2012 continues a career steeped in distinguished public service. She spent 11 years with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in various leadership positions, including as Deputy Chief Counsel for the Auditor General. And for the Department of Treasury, she was De Deputy Chief Counsel and Deputy State Treasurer for Administration. Judge Schwab also has extensive experience from private law practice. As our jurist in residence, Judge Schwab is teaching a class to our students in addition to public engagement like this program. Please join me in welcoming Judge Schwab. Thank you, Professor Family. Before we begin, I want to express my gratitude to, to Dean Johnson and to Professor Family for inviting me to be the Jurist in Residence at Widener University Commonwealth Law School. It is, it is such an honor for me to serve the school in this way. And as a member of the inaugural class, it's amazing to see how much this school has flourished and grown and really become ingrained in our local legal community and, and beyond. And I just have to say, I didn't think there would ever be a day when I would be up here teaching of sorts and Professor Dean would be sitting, having to listen <laughs> to me. I also want to thank the Law and Government Institute and recognize the law school's commitment to training future government lawyers and instilling in them a sense of pride for government service. I want to welcome and thank our distinguished uh, panel members that are here with us tonight, um, members of the bench, that are here with us, faculty, those of you who have decided to dedicate your lives to public service, to friends, students, and family, and especially my husband, Matt, who has supported me uh, throughout my career. Finally, I want to express gratitude to my panel members who I've corralled for this evening <laughs> and who have taken time out of their busy lives to, to join us for this interesting discussion and conversation um, about pretrial issues in our country. Let me just highlight some of the bona fides of the panel members here before you. We have um, Judge Richard Lewis from the Dauphin County Court of Common Pleas, 
Judge Lewis is the president judge of Dauphin County, which uh, he was elected in 1993. Judge Lewis is a graduate of the Dickinson School of Law and the former district attorney of Dauphin County. He is the past president of the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association and a former member of the Pennsylvania Sentencing Commission. And, and I just want to stress that I'm only highlighting many, we could just spend all the whole hour going through the bona fides of everybody here on this panel. We have the United States Attorney with us, Dave Freed. Mr. Freed took the oath of office on November 27, 2017 to become the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. Mr. Freed has experience, uh, extensive experience in public service, including serving as the Cumberland County District Attorney from 2006 to 2017. He also has served as the first Assistant District Attorney in Cumberland and as an Assistant Assistant District Attorney in York County. Mr. Freed is also a graduate of the Dickinson School of Law, which we won't hold against. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have another Dickinson School of Law graduate with us. <laughs> we have our federal defender, Heidi Freeze. Uh, Ms. Freeze is the federal public defender for the Middle District of Pennsylvania, and she began her term in September of 2017. Before her selection by the Third Circuit as the federal public defender, Ms. Freeze served for 10 years as an assistant federal public defender in the Harrisburg Trial Division. Before entering public service, she was an associate at Miller, Poole, and Lord in New York, and her primary focus was on criminal defense cases ranging from simple traffic offenses to capital murder cases. Um, and finally, last but not least, we have Ms. Nisa Taylor, who drove here from Philadelphia, and we thank her for that. Ms. Taylor joined the Pennsylvania ACLU in 2017 as the Criminal Justice Policy Council. She served as an assistant public defender at the Defender Association of Philadelphia from 2005 until 2016. And at the Defender Association, she engaged in strategic litigation focused on criminal justice reform. Ms. Taylor is a graduate of the Temple University. <laughs> The name of this lecture is Bail, Risk, Release, and Reform. At one time, I think I had a working title called uh, Bail Beyond Dog the Bounty Hunter, but no, <laughs> nobody liked that. Um, when Dean Johnson and Professor Family asked me to undertake this role, I was committed to working on a legal topic that the students and I could uh, explore from a, a variety of perspectives, from the federal and state levels, and from the judicial, executive, and legislative perspectives. <coughs> I also wanted to explore a topic that affects people in their everyday lives every day. And as you're going to hear tonight, you're going to see how these decisions that we make, whether to release someone, pretrial, or detain them, has a profound impact on not only the defendant before us, but his or her family. Making release decisions uh, is something I do regularly as a United States magistrate judge. And, but as I prepared for the class and for this lecture, I was astounded at the amount of information, institutions, and research that is presently dedicated to this uh, topic. Our panel has been working on the front lines of criminal justice, uh, in the criminal justice system for many years. And tonight, we will explore the present pretrial practices and policies in use in our country and discuss recent reform efforts. What's working? What's not? And what are the issues going forward? I want to emphasize that we're talking tonight about predominantly state and federal adult pretrial uh, issues. Juvenile issues is a whole separate category. And um, unless there are specific issues that may come up, we're really not talking about immigration detention, just so we put it in perspective. <clears throat> if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand at any time, and we can take questions throughout the, the presentation. Judge Lewis, the, in 1998, Article I, Section 14 of the Pennsylvania Constitution was amended to read, all prisoners shall be bailable by sufficient sureties unless for capital offenses or for offenses for which the maximum sentence is life imprisonment, or unless no condition or combination of conditions other than imprisonment will reasonably assure the safety of any person and the community when the proof is evident or presumption great. 
As a state trial court judge and a former district attorney, could you give us your perspectives uh, on where we are in the Commonwealth right now on, on bail issues? Thanks, Mr. Judge. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what I uh, wanted to do is just take a few minutes and just outline bail as it exists in the Pennsylvania state courts today. Uh, what is bail? Well, according to our uh, appellate courts in Pennsylvania, bail is a security for who sets bail? Most of the time it's set by a magistrate judge, a magisterial district judge. Where is bail set? For the most part, bail is set at a proceeding known as preliminary arraignment. If a, an offender is arrested on a minor charge, more than likely he or she is released shortly after the booking process, and then a police officer files a criminal complaint uh, uh, within five days and a summons is set to the offender is sent to the offender. So we don't really have a, a bail process, at least not initially in most of those cases. However, if the matter is a bit more serious, then the offender is brought in front of the magistrate without unnecessary delay for this process that we call a preliminary arraignment. So again, most of the time it's a magistrate setting bail. Most of the time, quite frankly, in the middle of the night, early morning hours. That's when uh, the the busiest times are at any booking center <laughs> across Pennsylvania. And so that's when bail was set, obviously. What are the standards for setting bail? What does a magistrate have to look at? Well, Pennsylvania does not have bail guidelines. We have sentencing guidelines, but we don't have bail guidelines. All we have is a rule of criminal procedure, Rule 523, Pennsylvania Rule of Criminal Procedure, that says, uh, or, or that sets, I should say, release criteria factors that the magistrate should look at, examine, and balance in setting bail. What are those factors? Well, first and foremost, obviously, the nature of the offense. What is it? Is it a violent felony or is it a, a, a less serious property crime of some type of theft, for example? So what is it? Uh, any aggravating or mitigating factors? Is it a robbery that's a purse snatch where the uh, the proverbial little old lady was waiting for the bus on the corner and someone walks by or runs by or bites by and pulls the purse off her shoulder? Or is it a bit more serious? As the purse was coming off her shoulder, she grabbed it and was pulled to the ground and broke her leg. Now we have serious injury now. It's now elevated to a more serious form of robbery. So are there any aggravating or mitigating circumstances in the offense? Possible sentences. Is the person a first offender, uh, or is the person a frequent flyer? That is something that the magistrate uh, may look at. Obviously, it may affect sentencing. Um, then you look at the defendant himself or herself. Employment status: Do they work? Uh, is it a local? Uh, they work in a local uh, uh, business establishment, a local factory. Have they worked there for ten years, or they worked there for ten weeks? Uh, residency: Do they live in the area? Are they a transient? Uh, are they established here? They've been here all their lives or a significant portion of their lives, as well as their family consideration. They have family here. They have parents, siblings, children, and so forth here. In other words, they're, they're rooted to this area, or have they only been here a short while and they live somewhere else uh, before that, out of state or whatever the case may be? Previous bail record. Well, you know, that could go both ways. Uh, yeah, Judge, this guy's been on bail before. Uh, he's always shown. Oh, thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> he's always showed up. All right, well, that's a point in the, uh, in the offender's uh, uh, favor, obviously. Or, uh, well, we always had to go, uh, Judge, we always had to go out looking for this gentleman. All right, he never showed up for court. Well, obviously, that's a negative. But prior bail record, so that's a factor. Prior criminal record. We have sentencing guidelines in Pennsylvania. The sentencing guidelines, oh, obviously, turn it off. Oops, I didn't turn it off. I just the sentencing guidelines obviously get higher as there are more offenses in the person's background. Obviously, uh, so that's a factor. Any so evidence of prior? When, when the judge is going through these factors, is the defendant represented by counsel? Uh, can be, but they're not entitled to counsel uh, at this particular point in time. 
uh, in other words, they're not entitled to free counsel at that particular point in time. If an offender calls his uh, attorney, his or her attorney from the police station and says, hey, come on down, uh, I'm getting arraigned in, in the next hour or so, that's fine. The attorney can appear. But there's not automatically, at least in most of Pennsylvania, I can't speak for Philadelphia, I think they may, um, attorneys for the uh, public defender may uh, uh, have personnel in their uh, round, uh, roundhouse, I think, uh, uh, 24 hours a day. But that doesn't take place, obviously, in the smaller jurisdictions. Is there an attorney for the Commonwealth present? Not necessarily. Not probably necessary. not. Okay. But there is, and something I will mention, there is a representative in all likelihood, at least in our uh, particular county, from our local bail program, what we call Dolphin County Pretrial Services. They are there, and they are, in a sense, an advocate for the, uh, for the defendant, gathering information, presenting the best picture to the magistrate in the bail setting process. And oftentimes, they are designated by the magistrate to monitor, monitor the person while he or she is on bail. And that has become a very attractive alternative in recent years, and uh, our pretrial services right now in Dolphin County monitors about 1,700 uh, folks out on bail uh, in one stage of the proceedings or another. Uh, but otherwise, the, uh, uh, the magistrate looks at age, character, uh, reputation in the community, and so forth. What kind of bail can be set? Well, a lot of bail is un what they call unsecured, and it can take many forms. It can be a release on recognizance. The offender is released on his or her own good name. Or a release uh, on nominal bail. Some agency or some third person posts a nominal amount of money, usually a buck, Sometimes they, the judge doesn't even uh, take the dollar because that's more paperwork, so they just don't even take it. Uh, uh, but otherwise, it's unsecured. There's no money put on the table. Uh, if a, an offender uh, makes unsecured bail, he or she must agree to the, the conditions of bail. And they have to sign a document known as the bail bond, uh, pledging to honor these conditions. And they are, very simply, show up when you're required, Stay out of trouble. Don't bother any of the witnesses. Let us know if you change your address in writing within 48 hours and follow all the orders of the bail authority. Sort of common sense conditions. There's another category of bail that uh, allows for extra conditions, extra non-monetary conditions. Curfew, perhaps, or travel restrictions. Or I'm going to assign you to be supervised by the bail program. You check in with them, and I'll let you out, okay? Uh, again, very common condition. Uh, the other type of bail is what brings us here today, monetary bail. That's why we're here. That's the controversy. <coughs> People are in jail uh, pending trial, and they can't make bail, uh, sometimes in very small uh, monetary amounts, 100 bucks. They can't make it. Uh, they don't have the, the funds or the wherewithal to make it, and that may be true. So if the judge sets a monetary amount, how was that posted? Cash, cash is still king, okay? But you don't see cash in very large amounts of bail. The judge says, uh, sets something over a thousand bucks. You may see someone posting cash, but unlikely. Uh, usually in the smaller amounts, cash may be posted by the defendant or by some family member, significant other, whatever the case may be. Or bail can be posted through property. Uh, who posts property bail? Usually the person, uh, the two people in Pennsylvania who post the most property bail are mom and dad. Mom and dad put the house on the line, that junior is going to appear. Now, the deal is, however, for property bail, it's only the equity in the property that can be posted. So if the house is worth 100000 but there's that a magic piece of paper that we call a mortgage on the house uh, for 90000 when then the equity presumably is only 10000 So that's all that will be posted. So if the bail is $50,000, you need a couple of these houses from mom and dad, uncle, Harry, and, and so whatever the case may be. Uh, but every, they anyone they with aggregate a, them? Oh, they, yeah, absolutely. Anyone with an ownership interest has to sign on the dotted line pledging the house as security for Junior to appear. The other type of bail is uh, through a professional bondsman. Uh, they don't work for free. They charge money. They're licensed by the Commonwealth. Uh, Ten bucks for the first $100 of bail, 5% of the balance. 
okay? Um, another type of bail is 10% bail. Uh, the discretionary with the judge, of course. If the judge allows it, uh, let's say the bail is $10,000, uh, I'll allow you to post 10%. If mom and dad come in with a thousand bucks, the defendant gets out, okay? So they're the uh, main types of, of, of bail uh, that we see. Uh, again, pretrial services is now becoming more and more common in Pennsylvania counties. I don't think every county has pretrial services, but I think many of them do. Uh, and I think it's a very uh, good way uh, to monitor folks who are out on bail. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Lewis. So we're going to turn to Ms. Taylor. Um, I found this slide um, in my research. I came trying to look at numbers of pretrial incarceration rates, and this pretty much depicted and tracked with other um, figures that I found. This, this uh, chart comes from the uh, Prison Policy Initiative um, and basically shows us that about a half a million people right now in the United States are detained pretrial. And, and I think we'd all agree that seems to be the number that we've seen. And this means that they have been charged with a crime and uh, either they couldn't make bail or, or, or the judge didn't let them out because they found them to be a flight risk or a danger to the community, and um, they're sitting in jail. The little note there is the United States has more people detained before <coughs> trial than most countries have in their prisons and jails combined. I don't vouch for those. That, uh, statement there, but that seems, again, to track with some of the research that, that's out there. So I'm going to turn to you, uh, Nisa. Can you explain some of the issues? We, we just heard from Judge Lewis about state in the Commonwealth. What, what's your experience uh, in, in other states for, with the cash bail system? Well, interesting, interestingly, states across the, across the United States are becoming very, very concerned with the ever-increasing use of monetary conditions of bail pre-trial. Um, nationally, over the past three decades, the number of people assigned cash bail has risen from about 37% to 61%. And there's also been a steep increase in the amount of money assigned to people. And we're particularly concerned about this because what unaffordable cash bail means is that those who can afford to pay are released, while those who can't remain incarcerated pretrial. And we know that pretrial detention has a really devastating impact on individuals, on communities, and on case outcomes. Um, and I also think it's really important to remind folks at this point that at this stage, everyone who appears at preliminary arraignment is innocent until proven guilty. And one of the interesting things about our Constitution, um, which was drafted, the Pennsylvania Constitution related to bail was drafted by William Penn. And he wrote that all people shall be bailable. And that was a wild new invention at that time because he had experienced Quakers being jailed pretrial at astronomical rates in England and was determined to make a new law that would prevent that from happening. Um, and so it's been a really interesting shift that we are, we see so many people being held in this way. So, um, you know, one of the things that can happen in even three days of pretrial detention, someone can lose their job, their family or their child support, health care, access to medication. Um, and we also know that one third of jail deaths occur in the first seven days. So as, as Judge Lewis just explained so clearly, Pennsylvania law actually has a lot of different ways to release people pretrial. And monetary conditions of bail are only one of those ways. Um, and so what we have been, the other interesting thing is there is a comment to the rule, to Rule 524, that says no condition, whether monetary or non-monetary, shall ever be used to hold someone in custody until pretrial. And so it's been really interesting. So we have these laws on the books that are actually not that bad, but yet we just see sort of this ever-increasing pretrial population. That pretrial detention is also very damaging for people's cases. There's been a lot of research that shows people who are held pretrial get longer sentences, and they are more likely to plead guilty. And it's particularly dangerous for innocent folks, who are even more likely to plead guilty 
if they're being held just to get out and to return to their lives. So we're really trying to, in, in a way, it is a reform, but what we are also encouraging sort of a return in some ways, <coughs> looking back at the way in which the system was operating. We've been looking at the United States Supreme Court's bulletin from 1995 when they revised the rules of criminal procedure. And one of the reasons they revised them was because in 1995, they were concerned about the amount of people being held pretrial. Um, the one other thing I do want to mention about the impact is that in Pennsylvania, we really see a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Um, there was a 2016 report that came out that showed for folks who were charged with a weapons offense, same weapons offense, 33% um, of white people received cash bail and 78% of black people received cash bail. It is a really stark disparity in the difference of those receiving cash bail. And then across the United States, your chance of being detained pretrial is 87% higher if for blacks than it is for whites. So at the, at the ACLU, we really see this as a civil liberties issue, which is one of the reasons why we are working actively um, to look at this and to look at the ways in which we can reform this across the state. Okay, thank you. For our federal folks over here, the Eighth Amendment says, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. I'm going to turn to Ms. Fries and Mr. Fried. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Ms. Fries. Can you explain, federal bail system is, is much different, and it was reformed in 1984 under the Federal Bail Reform Act. Um, and why don't you tell us a little bit about, about those reforms and how we operate in the federal system. Sure. Thank you, Judge. And um, thank you for picking this important topic. I'm happy to be here and um, talk to you all about, I think, what really is an exciting area uh, where there's a lot of research and a lot of room potentially for improvement. So as Judge Schwab indicated, the federal bail system is much different from the state uh, system. Our starting point is, um, as the judge mentioned, the Bail Reform Act of 1984. And if I had to characterize it in one way, I would say that it's not a cash bail system, OK? Um, in my <coughs> 16, 17 years, I don't know that I've ever seen a cash bail set, perhaps once an unsecured <coughs> bail in a white collar case. Um, so while this proceeding, as I hope you're getting uh, a feeling for is indeed a very preliminary proceeding in both state and federal court. I don't know that I could have said it much better than Judge Schwab when she said it has a profound impact. Um, it is an incredibly important moment in the life of my client and his or her family. So the Bail Reform Act of 1984 and the Constitution, we start from a place that the system is actually supposed to be designed to maximize release. So a federal judicial officer, um, when seeing an individual who is presumed to be innocent, um, is supposed to look for the least restrictive means, starting first with a recognizance release, with a release on a promise to appear. If the judge determines that recognizance release is not appropriate, then the court is to look for conditions. Okay, what can we do to release this individual into the community to assure not only that, in, uh, that they will appear in court, but also the safety of the community. And the court can look to really endless conditions. I mean, you can let um, your imagination sort of go to work. There are go-to conditions, frankly, um, in federal court that we see, particularly in the Middle District, including uh, what we call a third-party custodian, someone who agrees to come into court um, and to sort of be the eyes and ears of the, of the judge, so to speak, and make sure this person appears. Um, and a whole other, what we often call sort of laundry list of conditions which could apply in a given case. Speaking of laundry, I think one time I, I ordered a, a guy to do the laundry. That was one of, one I of think his that's conditions, because he was sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> Perhaps I'll suggest that. Um, and only after that full analysis, um, if the court believes that there's really a risk of flight uh, or um, the possibility that the community is in danger should an individual be detained. Okay, that's the law, uh, that's sort of the framework from where we work in the federal system. And, and not to interrupt, but j j just to say, 
um, whereas when Judge Lewis was talking about state bail at the initial arraignment, in federal court at the arraignment, the defendant is represented by counsel. Either they have their own counsel or counsel is appointed, and the United States attorney is there. And usually they don't speak or uh, they never testify. That, so it's a very different setting. I, I just wanted to. to no, that's that. important. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Judge, because um, although it's many times happening at a very fast pace, mm -hmm. uh, counsel uh, is involved um, really almost at the inception and will be at that initial proceeding. Um, so how does the court make that inquiry? How are we all working with uh, limited information very quickly? Um, is through the probation office in the Middle District of Pennsylvania. Um, we have specific officers that have been trained in pretrial services. We are not large enough to have our own pretrial services office, but there is uh, sort of a division within our probation office. They prepare what's called a pretrial services report, and that report looks at a number of factors, including is this person working? What's their education? What's, drug, what's their drug history? Prior criminal record? Ties to community? Does this individual have children? Are they the uh, sole caretaker for perhaps a parent or a child? Sort of that whole approach. Again, it's very quick and dirty. I don't want you to think that this is happening over a period of days. This is happening 20, 30 minutes before the court proceeding. That this uh, sort of bare bones, but sometimes they're quite comprehensive. You'd be surprised at the amount of information um, that can be pulled together quickly uh, through the resources of the United States Probation Office. And this report is provided to counsel for both parties and to the court, and that's really a base from which the court works. We, we all are very concerned about that pretrial report for different, very different reasons. Um, and we want to make sure that that information is accurate and we're uh, setting forth our positions to the court, sort of interpret, interpreting, I would say, that uh, pretrial services report and advocating our positions. So um, that's the process. Now what actually happens with probation, and I'm not gonna really get into this because we could spend several hours and there are numerous scholarly articles, but probation really across the country in the United States, um, they do use risk assessment tools to try and predict based on all of these factors, what is the likelihood okay, that this person will in fact appear? What is the likelihood that this person will in fact be capable and able to abide by the conditions of the court? I will tell you that there is a strict prohibition, not only in the United States Constitution, but in the Bail Reform Act of 1984, that a federal judicial officer cannot set a monetary bail, which the defendant cannot afford. So many of these issues and concerns that we're hearing in the, in the state system to be very frank, they don't, they don't exist in the federal system. I think we have our own sort of set of issues um, that we need to be looking at, and I think there's improvement that we can make, but they're very different uh, sort of issues. So I think to sort of conclude this part, I, I thought it might be helpful for you to know where are we um, in the middle district. So nationwide, I will tell you that the federal detention rate is right around 59%. Um, and that excludes, that statistic excludes immigration cases, okay? And I say that because that is, again, as Judge Schwab indicated, a separate topic, okay? Um, so 59%, so let's break that down a little bit more. In the Third Circuit, in which we are, okay, the uh, detention rate uh, for the period ending uh, the fiscal year of 2017 was um, 46%. Pennsylvania Middle, 46%. Of individuals okay and when I then when we, you break it down further and go around the circuit well New Jersey's a little higher at around 57 percent PA middle is 46 and the circuit average is 46 so we sit right at around the circuit average for pretrial detention um, and I would say that's sort of a snapshot of where we are and I think that that statistic as I expect my colleague to tell you is partially driven by the type of cases and volume of cases, okay? Us sitting over here on the left-hand side, we're dealing with generally less volume and more felonies. And then I'll leave it to the United States Attorney to tell you about that. Thank you. I think, um, I think your thoughts are gonna be interesting, Dave, just because you now, you've been on the state side, now on the federal side. So what are your I, observations? I agree that my thoughts will be interesting. Yeah, no. <laughs> At least to me. Um, 
you know, that 46% number, I, it seems to me to be spot on, and it's directly related to the kind of work that we do. It, it's, it's really drugs and violent crime drives the criminal business in the Middle District. Um, I want to tell you a, a brief tale uh, about a, a, a bail situation, a release situation in front of Judge Schwab that illustrates that she is not only brilliant but wise. Uh, about a year oh, ago, the laundry one? The la no, it's not no. the laundry one. Right, okay. uh, about a year ago, uh, uh, and this is all public record, a defendant had an initial appearance on a set of very serious charges. It's a physician uh, who, at the time he was arrested, was the number one prescriber of opioids in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and he was working out of uh, essentially Northumberland and Schuylkill County. And if you know Pennsylvania at all, you'd be surprised that the number one prescriber is from Northumberland and Schuylkill County. My family's from Pottsville, so I'm not insulting anybody from the coal regions. Uh, but it's a surprise. It's, it's, it's a, not a highly populated area. And uh, we made a motion for detention uh, pursuant to the statute, and, and Judge Schwab uh, asked some questions of, of the defendant. And, and the motivator for our motion was we didn't want this guy out there prescribing any more drugs. We wanted him to give up his DEA license. He was reluctant to do that. So Judge Schwab ordered him detained in Dauphin County Prison, and this is not a comment on Dauphin County Prison, there's Dauphin County Commissioner here. Dauphin County does it right with pretrial services, trust me. Uh, so Judge Schwab committed him to Dauphin County Prison and set a hearing the next day at 10 a.m. So this is about 2 p.m. The hearing was set for the next day at 10 a.m. He spent the night in Dauphin County, he came back in and at 10 a.m. was willing to give up his DEA He's license. waving that license. <laughs> right, right. And was thereafter released and is not one of the numbers of folks detained. Uh, oh, he looks so bad. <laughs> one night in Dauphin County. One night, and one night, in, any, for one night in any prison is tough, is tough. Um, so, so that's a story of, of how at least one case, a serious case, worked in the federal system. The presumption is really not to detain. Uh, and uh, in my experience, it's somewhat more limited than, than my, my colleague here, uh, it works. Now, remember, the federal system is generally better resourced. We're dealing with fewer cases, and we have more resources than exist at the state level. Uh, so the good news about criminal justice reform uh, is that it is proceeding at breakneck speed. It's been going on for longer than I think most of the public knows, but it's become much more visible lately. Uh, and I don't know if it's bad news, but I think the real news at this point is the low-hanging fruit has been picked, right? The nonviolent offenders are not going to jail. Uh, every, people are getting diverted. We're figuring all that out. We're emphasizing treatment, especially at the local level. The tough thing now is what do we do with the harder cases? It, our prisons are full. They're full with people who've done some violent things. How do we deal with that hard number, that big number that's there uh, in reform efforts? Well, one way we can do it if we do bail correctly is they don't get in there in the first place because the longer they spend, uh, the more likely they are to spend more time down the road to be convicted and to have worse outcomes later down the road. So the bail decision initially is absolutely critical. It doesn't matter if you're at state or federal level. Can, can I ask you a question about that? And, and, and just I don't, we're, I need to move it along, but talk, uh, can you tell me if somebody, it, we always hear that if you are detained, that it goes worse for you and sentencing, at, you, it could go worse for you at sentencing and even programming that you might get in federal prison. Do, uh, is that accurate or do I not have that right? Heidi might be better to answer that question. What, what I will say is uh, one of the difficult things about bail at the local level is people tend, people who get into, so it's a smaller percentage of the population that gets in the most trouble and gets repeatedly in trouble. Hmm. And anywhere in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, we have 67 counties, county borders are fluid, so people tend to have involvement in more than one county, and their, their issues will follow them from county to county. So somebody might get a reasonable bail in Cumberland County, but have a detainer from Dauphin County that holds them in. So a very tough problem at the local level is detainers that follow people around. Uh, that don't allow them to be released. Heidi, do you want to address that detention issue in the federal system? Sure. So the answer is yes. Uh, the um, detention of an individual at the inception uh, of a case will have impacts all the way through service of his or her sentence if they're ultimately convicted. And in over 90, what's the statistic? 90, however many percent, 98 percent, roughly? Nine, 96 in the middle district, which would be the highest in the third circuit. Explain that, though. It, it, you're saying that 98 percent of all cases that come before end us in a end in a conviction. Okay, end in, in a federal conviction. federal court. 
Yeah. Uh, despite the best, uh, the best efforts of the Federal Public <laughs> Defender's <laughs> Office in the Middle District of Pennsylvania. However, uh, so the answer is yes. And the reason that's so important is because it sets the stage for many times what will happen down the road. What will that individual security classification be within the Federal Bureau of Prisons? A reduction is given if you've been out on bail. A further reduction is given if you have a voluntary surrender to your institution, meaning after your sentence, the judge says you have three to four weeks to report. So it has long-lasting impact, and to the, to the judge's point, it's important to remember that those impacts sometimes aren't good. An individual who gets out on bail and is unable to abide by the conditions also can have the the adverse, very adverse effects when they come before a court for sentencing. Okay. Judge, so let me wrap yeah, up with yeah, just yeah, a couple, couple brief points. Um, you have to remember, uh, you know, we're in an adversary system. So as a prosecutor, I have a community protection role. So uh, you'll hear prosecutors often emphasize that, you know, future dangerousness, community protection uh, role in the system, and that's an important role for us to play. Um, at, at the state level, at the local level, uh, if somebody is incarcerated, generally their preliminary hearing is supposed to be held within three to ten days. In a lot of busy counties, that doesn't happen. So that adds to people being held in before trial. Uh, and, and finally, uh, the, the, the answers are out there. Uh, Dauphin County, in particular, does it very well with, with pretrial services uh, to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do to help guarantee that appearance. Uh, and to make sure the community is protected. It's not that way everywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, bail guidelines, I think, would be a huge help uh, because if you read or do any research on this, there are some great stories in the Carlisle newspaper. It's cumberlink.com if you ever want to look them up uh, that will show you the disparity in bail even among magisterial district judges within a couple different counties mm -hmm. in central Pennsylvania. So the numbers are all over the place, and that's really, really no way to run a railroad. No, no. And you bring up a, a good point about reform and Dauphin County. So I'm going to turn to you, Judge Lewis. You, you all are doing some exciting things in Dauphin County. Do you want to explain well, those for us? Well, uh, as I indicated uh, previously, we do have a very well-established pretrial services program. In some counties, they call it the bail program. We call it pretrial services. So whatever it's called uh, in various counties, I, I think approximately, trying to remember an exact number, approximately uh, half of the counties in Pennsylvania have some type of pretrial services that monitors people on bail. So we've been very successful in that regard. Secondly, uh, at the urging of our county commissioners who are very concerned about the population in the jail, because obviously they're paying the bills, uh, and they're also funding the courts. So when the commissioners speak, uh, and one of our commissioners is here, we tend to listen, all right? Uh, that's, they control our budget. So uh, their concern was, hey, shouldn't we have a uh, risk assessment uh, process uh, with, uh, with respect to bail, something similar to what they do in Allegheny County. So we visited, we liberally copied uh, the uh, Allegheny <laughs> County system, tweaked it to our own use, and in November of 2018, we put, into, uh, we put it into effect. So now we have a pretrial risk assessment process in Dauphin County. So it's just starting. It's only been two and a half months, if you will, three months, if you will. Uh, but, but, it's, but it's beginning. We have our pretrial services that does the calculation that takes into a lot of factors that, that Heidi and I both mentioned previously, you know, uh, prior bail record, your prior criminal record, uh, employment, uh, uh, residence, uh, and so forth, age, and so forth, and comes up with a recommendation based on the risk assessment, the likelihood that this person is going to appear. And that is presented to the magistrate at the uh, preliminary arraignment process. And the magistrates, uh, in, again, in Dauphin County, it's a process, and they're beginning to rely more and more on this process, so we're looking for great things to come in, in the months to follow. Uh, again, uh, it's a very successful program in Allegheny County, and we're hopefully, hoping to duplicate that same success in Dauphin County. Um, and, but the risk assessment, am I correct, is same with the federal system, doesn't uh, uh, take the place of any judicial discretion. Uh, that's correct. The magistrate can accept the recommendation or 
decide to uh, come up with his or her own decision as to uh, what kind of conditions or what kind of monetary bail to set. Uh, again, most of our recommendations are for a, um, an unsecured type of release with heavy, heavy, heavy reliance on pretrial services. How many people are in your pretrial services office? I think they have about uh, 25 or so. Uh, Commissioner, you, you may have a better handle on the number of, of pretrial service employees, you know? There we go. That's wonderful. Thank you. Nisa, there's so much going on on the state level in reform, and in five minutes or less, can you <laughs> talk about... Uh, uh, what's happening globally, sure. you know, in the United States on this issue? So it, there has indeed been an explosion of activity related to this issue. Um, many states have eliminated cash bail. Well, not many. A few states have been working to eliminate cash bail. I want to point to Washington, D.C., which has not had cash bail since 1992. They release 90 percent of the people who come through pretrial. They do have a very robust pretrial services um, system, which also provides a lot of needs-based support. So folks who come in with addiction get treatment. Folks who, folks who come in you know, might have transportation issues get support coming to court. Um, New Jersey just recently eliminated cash bail as well. New Jersey did so with a heavy reliance on a risk assessment tool, I believe a similar tool to the one being used in Allegheny County. One of the flags I want to sort of put in with relation to risk assessment tool is that many of them are predicated upon prior, prior criminal activity, so either prior arrests or prior criminal conduct. And what we've seen is that a lot of that criminal, uh, criminal history is dependent upon policing practices. So unfortunately, while New Jersey has made great strides in terms of the, reducing their prison population, they are, I think, like second in the nation when it comes to racial disparities. Because we know that, you know, the, the sort of racial disparities that exist from arrest through conviction can often be amplified through risk assessment tools. So it's just sort of a caution. Um, and not to say that it's recommendations of release we are always supporting, but we do need to be careful how we use these reform efforts. California, to a great fanfare, just announced SB 10, which is set to reduce or eliminate cash bail, but it came with this very troubling caveat that would wildly expand the number of people who could be held pretrial just on the basis of their charge alone. And we've sort of been seeing a lot of that with the reforms. People are making reforms, but then they're saying, well, everyone with a gun charge should be held. And so, you know, it's, we really want to look, I, I think it's really important to return to the Constitution um, and sort of what our Pennsylvania Constitution sets out, which is that everyone should be bailable. And the Third Circuit in Holland, in a recent case, really defined that as being everyone should be releasable. <coughs> unless, as in the federal system, there is a real risk of danger or a real risk of flight or someone needs to be, you know, we need, there are people who are too dangerous to be let out pretrial. But those people are not everyone who's being held in pretrial. Most of the people held in pretrial are just poor, and that's why they're being held. And until we really shift that, I think that system will remain. Any, any reform happening in Texas? The, judge ah. that, the dis, <laughs> district judge in Texas just issued an 88-page yes. opinion uh, entering a preliminary injunction against Harris County for unconstitutional bail practice. So I don't want to, that could be like a whole. No, no, all right. All right let's, <laughs> but, but really quickly, there has been some really great litigation around the country related to the, the federal constitution, the due process and equal protection mm -hmm. clauses being applied to state practices. Right. And Harris County, Texas, very similar to Pennsylvania, has rules of criminal procedure that are almost identical to ours. But as with our, our courts, for example, in Philadelphia, no one's following the rules. And the same thing was happening in Harris County, and people were just being held. And so lawsuits have been filed. Judges were fighting fiercely against it. But then there was this new election, and all the judges who were fighting against the bail lawsuit have been booted out of office. So then now the judges are working in tandem um, with the reform. So that's why there was this sort of like wild stuff happening in, in Harris County. That's interesting. 
Heidi, t speak a little bit about federal diversionary practice, and we're going to give Mr. Freed the last word. Yeah. Sure. Right. So um, I think I would probably characterize it as change is glacial. Um, and I, I think it could probably move a little faster, but there's a good reason to be careful and cautious about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And there are concerns always about resources um, and how we have these great ideas, but what does it really look like in practice and how are we actually going to make it happen on the ground? So there are some exciting things happening around the country in different districts. Um, there is actually one particular program that um, I looked at that really got my attention, which is was developed actually by the Administrative Office of United States Courts, and it's called the DROP program, mm -hmm. Detention Reduction Outreach Program. Um, that program's been um, unrolled in about 15 districts, and in summary, it includes a two-day educational effort among the stakeholders, federal public defender, U.S. attorney, the court, <coughs> probation. Um, a team comes in and really uh, educates everyone on do we really need detention? Basically, the over-detention of individuals uh, pre-trial. Um, and I think that that's a really exciting program. There are some, t some statistics to mm -hmm. show that it's working, that in those districts where this program has been on, um, uh, has gone into effect, that there's a detention rate up to, uh, reduction, excuse me, and up to 12%. There are also a whole host of diversionary programs that are contingent upon the release of an individual at that critical initial stage. What am I talking about? I'm talking about programs where their conviction, where an individual is released on pretrial, and then they're able to go through a diversionary rehabilitative program. One of those is called the RISE program in Massachusetts. There's the SAIL program. And that's a true pre-trial diversionary program that has some real meaningful um, support and effort to rehabilitate. Um, these programs are very costly, but what we know is that they work. Um, so that's the, the struggle there. And, and are they really costly when you consider the cost of incarcerating someone? So, so you can see that becomes a very uh, complicated discussion, but I think it's an important discussion, and I think federal courts are really behind state courts quite a bit as far as pretrial diversionary programs. Here in the Middle District, we have in name a pretrial diversion program. Um, that's what it's called. Last year, six defendants went through it. Um, there are so many exclusions that the reality is, is hardly anybody gets into it. That's where we are now. I think, though, um, I've been really impressed with the United States Probation Office in our district really cutting-edge training that they're receiving um, and efforts towards rehabilitating um, individuals uh, when they're on pretrial, really getting involved in some awesome stuff. So I've been really impressed here in the Middle District, and I'm very hopeful that through collaboration we can continue to take baby and maybe even big steps, the eternal optimist, maybe even big steps, um, towards some meaningful change. But um, it has to be really carefully studied, and that's at a time when, you know, resources, although we're well-resourced um, in the federal system, um, we don't have uh, endless resources to do everything we might want to do. So, Dave, given the last word, again, from your perspective, you're seeing the whole picture here. What, what are your final thoughts? On so, specialty things? courts, specialty programs, pretrial diversion works. Uh, as I think my colleague to my immediate right mentioned, though, uh, those programs are costly and time-consuming. Uh, but the outcomes are better than you're going to see anywhere. As, as a local prosecutor, state prosecutor, I diverted uh, a larger percentage of my total caseload than, than at one time anybody in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, absolute believer in, in, in pretrial diversion. Uh, and we expanded what we did. For example, we were giving people a second bite at the apple on a driving under the influence diversion after a certain period of time before it became part of the law in 2004. Um, at the federal level, you know, Heidi and I have somewhat joked about this, although you know, you know, we take our jobs very seriously. Uh, if there's a case that's el eligible for diversion in my office, I don't think it should be in my office in the first place. I don't think it's a federal case. We should be doing bigger cases. But think about the decisions that have to be made. And I'll, I'll just, there's so much more to talk about, but I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it with this. Consider someone who is charged with possession with intent to deliver uh, or sale of drugs. And it's, it's a fairly substantial amount. It's a, an amount substantial enough that it has garnered the attention of the federal prosecutors in the Middle District of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, and that person comes in and tells uh, their representative from Heidi's office, I have a substance abuse disorder. And that's why I was doing it. So it's the classic person who was selling to support his or her habit, but selling an amount that made it interesting to us on a federal level. Those are the kind of tough cases that we have to deal with. Is, is that a case that should get diversion or not? Yes. Uh, I make. <laughs> okay, we're done. Let's go to the reception. Um, at the state level, I had to make those decisions all the time, and, and somebody in the audience here that's nodding his head has heard me say this many, many times. We have to make the decision. Uh, it, was that drug sale truly related to that person's substance use disorder? Okay. Made those decisions all the time uh, at the state level. Uh, we may end up engaging in that at, at the federal level, mm -hmm. but from my perspective, I'd like us to be doing bigger cases so those, those cases don't even, even get into federal, rec federal court. Um, the reform efforts are, you know, they're important. If, if we just say, well, this is the way we've always done it, uh, well, things will never improve. Uh, and and I, I don't know if there's anything we could say, well, we should just do it that way because we've always done it that way uh, in, any, in any facet of our lives. So uh, it, it, what you see, what you don't see often is the work that's done behind the scenes, uh, and there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, but those of you who are students in particular, uh, what this area of the law is going to look like in, in 20 years, when I look back 20 years, uh, what I'm doing today looks nothing like what, what we were doing 20 years ago, so it's a very exciting time. That's how I characterize it. I agree. We have a few more minutes left for questions. Um, nobody asked. Or, Ms. Wilson. The discretion means when it's in front of you. What is a judge, what is your process in thinking when looking at recommendations? What does that look like in the mind of a judge? As, as to bail? Yes. Or as to just as to to bail record, and release. Sentencing yes. and direct, well, just bail, to bail. Yeah. To bail. Well, again, in the Court of Common Pleas, where I said, uh, again, we don't see, we don't get bail questions every day. Most bail is, is in our state system is handled at the magistrate level. We only see it uh, in terms of a, uh, of a uh, motion to modify bail. If they're not happy with what the magistrate has decided, a preliminary hearing in all likelihood has already taken place, the case has been bound over to court, then if, if the offender is still in jail, defense counsel may file a motion to modify bail. Uh, and then we have to have a hearing, essentially, uh, and uh, look at all those factors that I just mentioned listen to the prosecutor's argument, listen to defense counsel's argument, and make a decision. We tend to modify, if it's a nonviolent crime, we, we tend to modify downward quite often. If it's a crime of violence, if the person has a significant record, likely, less likely to do so. It, again, uh, the most common answer in the criminal justice system, at least in the state system, the most common two-word answer in the system is, it depends. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. Um, I, think, I think Heidi and Dave would agree with me. For me, uh, you know, listen, at many of our defendants have state detainers, so they're not getting out anyway, right? I would say at least 50% of them are, have state detainers. Maybe I'm wrong on that statistic, but it's a lot. With regard to the rest, under the Bail Reform Act, we can look at different factors. One of them is the strength of the government's evidence. So, um, and this gets into whole, a, a lot of other issues that Heidi and Daryl Bloom brought up in our class, which is the government knows all the evidence and the federal and the defender does not, right? So strength of the evidence has made, made the difference for me sometimes when I've wanted to, in my own mind, give somebody a break, but then the government shows that not only, only were they trying to lure somebody on, uh, you know, a 12-year-old on Facebook in, on these dates, but I have all these other records where they were lure, trying to lure other children. You know, that, that solidifies it for me. And I, I would say more times than not, it comes down for me to that third-party custodian. That, you know, who is that person? And it's usually mom or girlfriend or wife, I, that's just usually who it is. Who is that third party that's going to stand up and be the babysitter, be the person that's the eyes and ears for the court? If it's a strong third party defendant or third party custodian, then I have a level of comfort that if there's misbehavior, it's going to get reported to the court. 
if it's a weak third party custodian or I have no sense that that defendant is going to pay, you know, mind that person or um, then I, so sometimes it comes down to that. And then I hate saying this, but right? It depends. And sometimes it comes down to, I, I'm going to go with my gut. I've looked this person in the eye. It's so important for them to be in front of you. They try to talk to their lawyer, and I get a sense of maybe who they are. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, or I go with my gut sometimes. I don't envy you. It's, it's got to be incredibly difficult. I don't envy really that position because it's very difficult. And many judges who have been on the bench for a long time will tell you that they have a tragic story of someone that they released that then committed potentially a horrible crime, sometimes took their own life. Mm -hmm. Or you have the reverse, somebody who they put in and they, you know, it's just difficult. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Yes, sir. Cash bill completely eliminated or just more rare? And would you like to see pension free trail become significantly more rare? I'm going to turn to my state colleagues here and have them. Uh, Go, yeah, we'll, so we'll give you we'll give you not a thanks, free pass here. Um, <laughs> so I think it's I don't necessarily think the cash is the problem. I think it's the wealth based detention. I think if everyone were assigned bail they could pay or if cash were widely reduced, I think we would have far fewer issues. One of the things that I, I'm really going to encourage everyone to do is turn to the rules of criminal procedure 520 through 528. They really do set out reasonable methods for calculating. So the reform is kind of tricky because what we're effectively talking about is how do you change practice? And I do think there is some room for a real reduction in the use of cash bail. But I think that that, and I do think that could come from the Supreme Court. So our, our Supreme Court governs the rules of criminal procedure, and we're hopeful that they will issue a new set of rules that do reduce reliance on that. But we, we don't necessarily want to see an increase in pretrial detention. That is really our largest concern. So smaller people detain pretrial overall. It's very expensive. I think in the article that uh, Mr. Fried was referring to that the Sentinel talked about, what was it, like six, almost $70 a day? That was a few years ago in Cumberland County. How much money it costs the county, right, Commissioner? Not $91 in Dauphin County, which most people would pay $91 to get out of, right? <laughs> but, you know, it's expensive, right? And there, and uh, counties have other uh, things they need to spend money on. Other questions? I'm sorry, ma'am. I'll, I'll, let me go first, just very, very quickly. Um, so county prisons are, in 2019 in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, essentially detox and mental health treatment facilities. Maybe treatment's not even the right word, just mental health housing facilities. And they're not drug treatment facilities, they're detox facilities. People can detox, but they're not treated. So uh, Nisa, you probably know the percentages of people with serious mental illness and, and drug addiction. And, and for many people, it's co-occurring mm -hmm. uh, in the county prisons. And, and the we see the system. same thing with, with the folks coming through the federal system. Yeah. Anyway, we have a, um, a, a mental health officer at the jail. They get right on it. If when someone comes in with a mental health issue, there is an immediate assessment, and we try to get them whatever uh, help we can at, at this initial level. So there is some effort made right up front. Uh, is it a perfect system? No. Uh, are they overwhelmed with the number of uh, mental health issues? Absolutely. Uh, one of the problems we have is that uh, uh, from a police standpoint, they have nowhere else to go. Uh, if they find a person that uh, on the street uh, who has potentially committed a crime uh, and they have no other alternative but to take them to arraignment. And the magistrate, many times, has no other release resource 
for the person other than the street. And so too, too often they're put in jail because there's no other place to go. There are no other mental health facilities that are going to accept the person and so forth. So that's one of the largest problems that we have uh, is, is what to do with folks who have an obvious mental health uh, issue. Uh, across it, the country, a homelessness problem. is also well, a big oh, issue. No, no doubt about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I better wrap it up, um, but I just want to thank this panel. This, we just touched the tip of the iceberg on this issue, and I hope it sparked some interest. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.